Okay. Apparently some people didn't note that there was an OpenStax assignment for today. Um, I apologize. I probably should remind because last semester we didn't have OpenStax assignments on the Monday before an exam. And this semester we do. Um, I did not assign the homework that it shows in the schedule for you to try to give you more time tonight to prepare for the test tomorrow. I, yeah, I'm sorry about that confusion. Before we get started with the lecture, a reminder once again that tonight, wait, is it tonight? Tomorrow night, tomorrow night at 6 p.m., um, TJ Slater from Cleveland University of Chiropractic and Health Sciences in Kansas City will be here and they will be feeding you pizza. And I was asked to try to get an estimate on how many people would be coming so they know how much pizza to purchase. So who is intending to attend? What is exactly is it on? Breaking people's backs. Oh, that. To thing. fix okay. their backs. To fix them, to fix them. Exactly. Anyone planning on attending? All right. Now, while we're on the schedule, tonight. Oh, come on. I can't write on not stuff. Tonight, what time is your game? Seven. Tonight, 7 p.m. The gentlemen will be playing a basketball game, their penultimate game. Against Doan. Against Doan. Is, is Doan the one that you've beaten? Yes. Okay. So if you want to see your men win a game at home tonight, what, once again, what time? Seven? Seven. Tonight, 7 p.m. Come root for DJ. Root for Ryan. Root for other people that I don't know. Um, also, they have a game Tuesday night. What time is the game Tuesday night? Seven. Seven again? So 7 p.m., and that will be the ultimate game for the season, if I understand correctly. Yeah. <laughs> so your last chance to come and root on your classmates. So I think it would be great if you could attend. We – no, Some people do that. It, it's yeah, not if relevant <laughs> if we're participating. <laughs> no. Yes, I. Mayor has a question. No. Yes. I do for when they not this are over for us. Um, go ahead. What is, so what is due on Wednesday then? Okay, so what is due on Wednesday? So on Wednesday there will be a before class, a reading assignment, and then there will be a homework assignment. The one that I assign Friday afternoon is due on Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. I, I, I put up an assignment on um, Expert TA on Friday that's due on Wednesday. I, I made it so it's not due tonight so people have more time to prepare for the exam. Oh, oh. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Trace. Comment. Scrapbook is due tonight. So do on. Yes, scrap, scrapbook is due tonight at 11.59 p.m. Um, turn in a single PDF document that should have a, a title page that says who you are and five entries from chapters 18 through 21. Following the same format as before, make sure you remember to put the section in the textbook that it talks about it and what the textbook says about it, along with the date that you looked at it and how I can access it to see it as well. Ryan, you had a question? Yeah. Just out of curiosity, why is the scrapbook 159 book lab or 155? Um, th this is a good question. Up until the latest version of Moodle, I couldn't choose anything between 55 and 60. It went by five minutes only. And so the ones that are 55 is I was trying to go to the latest possible time, and that's the latest it allowed me. And I suppose I could have a student worker, not now because Nathan can't be the student worker for the class while we're in class. I had him set it up before. I couldn't have him go for the 159 instead of 155, but I did not think about it. Yeah. I have a quick question. Just I don't, know, I don't know if you mentioned this before or not, but for the scrapbook, um, are we allowed to put videos that we found too? Yes. Okay. Just make sure you have a screenshot or something so you have a picture of the media there. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Any other questions? 
Okay, our exam tomorrow is going to be over electricity, right? This section is over electricity. The next exam will be over magnetism. Then we'll have optics and move from there. So let's look at the stuff we have. So from chapter 18, I know this is small print. Oh, by the way, you guys, hopefully you saw the announcement that you can go to YouTube, look at the tutorials, and see the solutions there for the worksheets. Uh, you had a question, Leslie? I have no idea where to find the worksheets. I looked all over them. Okay, if you look on Moodle, for each chapter, I have resources and I have the worksheet there under resources. So if you look like in chapter 18, there's resources and there's a worksheet for chapter 18. It's down below all of the assignments. If you minimize the assignments box, you'll find it much quicker. <laughs> or collapse it, excuse me. Okay. Oh, and also I did put up supplemental homeworks. I actually was thinking very few people looked at those and maybe the worksheets would take their place, which is why I did put them up previously. But since the student asked, I put up supplemental homework problems for you to practice on as well. And I will use both the worksheets and the supplemental homeworks in guiding me as I write the test. Seriously now reviewing. Chapter 18, we learned about electric charge. Electric charge is a fundamental property of material that we experience because there's a force associated with it. So, I mean, that's, that's how we know things have charge is because we can see the force interaction. And so we can separate charges by rubbing. Uh, I don't know if he included this or not, but Nathan showed me a, a meme with John Travolta going like this on a carpet. <laughs> and then it shows him filling up with charge because he's rubbing and charge is transferring between the carpet and his foot. It's, it's kind of funny. So we separate charge by rubbing. There are other ways, but that's the way that we started. Um, the two types... If you listen to my explanation of the worksheets, I accidentally screwed up at one point and said, opposites attract, repel. No, opposites attract, likes repel. Make sure you remember opposites attract, likes repel. It's kind of an important principle. And so the forces between charges are always either toward each other or away from each other. And we find that force using Coulomb's law, which is force between two objects is a constant K charge of object one charge of object two over the separation between them squared. Now this law is only technically correct. If you have two point charges, that is charges with no volume. But if you have spherically symmetric charges, it also works if you take the center of those charges. And if you're far enough away, everything's a sphere. Question. Can I use a different color? Yes. The contrast is good on this screen. Uh, here, this one will. This one should have high contrast. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So make sure that you can calculate the electric force between two charges. Do the magnitude separately from the direction and then add vectors to get the, the resultant if you have more than two charges. Question, Leslie. So the charges, again, those are absolute values, right? The um, well, the equation is technically a vector equation. That means you put a vector sign over the F and then I have an R hat at the end. So here, since I don't have the vector sign, I would generally find the magnitude and thus I put absolute values like you said. Okay, so there would be no negative when you put the charges in? Um, if, if I'm finding just the match of the force, right, there's no negatives. And I use opposites, attract, and likes repel to determine the direction. Okay, so make sure you can find those forces. Find the force with three charges, four charges. I don't think I'm going to have a situation with more than four charges. I hope not because it just is adding to the pain without any actual difficult or difference in what you need to know so why would you do that but three charges you know that's a different scenario than two charges okay then we have electric field electric field is a very useful idea and that's why we have it it's not there to confound 
or confused. And the electric field is the force per charge. So instead of finding the force between two charges, we find the electric field caused by one charge. Then we say, now if I brought a second charge here, what would the force be? And we say, okay, I've got this electric field that has a direction and a magnitude, and the force will be force vector is equal to the second charge I bring times the electric field due to the first charge. And so for a, for a point charge, the electric field is equal to K Q over R squared. And I put that as a vector equation. The direction for the electric field is always out of positive charge and into negative charge. Now that equation, keep in mind, that equation is only for point charge. The two equations above the center point are only for point charges. The equation below is going to work for any point charge in an electric field created by who cares what. Right? If you're in a region with an electric field, we don't care about what created it at the point of finding the force. We just care that the force is the electric field vector times the charge. Now, an important aspect as we lead into the next section is that the force is going to, if I just release a charge, it's going to do work on the charge. It's going to have force. It's going to move in response to that force. And the force times distance parallel to the force is the work. So if I have a positive charge, the direction of the force will be in the same direction as the electric field because of that vector equality. If it's a negative charge, what direction is the force? If I have an electric field, if I have an electric field like this, what direction would the force be on a negative charge? Can't see that either? Um, that, that would be magnetism. Okay, I don't want to use the same color. How does this work? Does that show up? Okay, then I'll just stick with the one that works. Just stick with this one. If I have an electric field like this, and I have a negative point charge, what direction is the force on that charge? Opposite. And so if I release that, it's going to naturally move in the direction opposite to the electric field. But what's happening to its potential energy? It's moving because of that force. And so it's naturally going to be moving with the force and lowering its potential energy. So that negative charge would move to the left and lower its potential energy. Or if I put a positive charge, what direction would the positive charge move? The force for a positive charge would be to the right. So it would move to the right. And what would be happening to its potential energy? It's moving with the force, so its potential energy is, again, dropping. So the positive and negative charge will move in opposite directions with respect to the electric field, but they're both moving to lower potential energy. That's what's driving things. The force is what the whole potential energy is about, and if you just release it, it's going to move with the force, lowering its potential energy. Make sure that you can understand electric field lines. The closer the lines are, the stronger the electric field. The direction of the electric field is the direction of the lines. And that leads us into Gauss's law. Now, phys people in physics 252 are doing homework problems with Gauss's law and having lots of fun, right? Yes, lots of fun. <laughs> Gauss's law is a statement that fundamentally you learned in class, even though I didn't say Gauss's law in this class. Gauss's law says that the number of electric field lines coming out of a region is proportional to how much charge is enclosed. In class, I said, the number of electric field lines coming out of a point charge is proportional to that charge. Same thing. So if I have something that's plus 6 coulombs, another one that's plus 3 coulombs, the one with plus 6 coulombs is going to have to have twice as many electric field lines coming out as the one with plus 3 coulombs. That's what Gauss's law is saying. So 
while in Physics 152 we never mentioned the words Gauss's Law, we did talk about Gauss's Law and the, you know, how to use that for drawing electric field lines. In the Physics 252 class, we talked about how to use Gauss's Law in more general sense because it requires some understanding of calculus, even though they're not using calculus for it. Um, chapter 19, electric potential and electric field. So I've already talked about the electric field and the particles will always go toward lower potential energy. Electric potential, otherwise known as voltage, despite what the OpenStax might have said, is change in electric potential is change in potential energy over charge. That's the definition of electric potential. It's defined by its change. And so we're measuring the potential energy per charge, hence the units of joules per coulomb. And make sure that you remember, hey, that voltage is telling you about the potential energy per charge. So, for instance, in chapters 20 and 21, when we were going through circuits, we had the voltage drop across a resistor. That's telling you how much energy per charge you are gaining if you go against it or losing as current goes through. And, of course, resistors always actually are taking away energy. It's just if you're going backward through the circuit that appears to go up. So electric potential, also known as voltage, is very useful because it's a scalar. It's easier to work with scalars. If I want to find the voltage due to three point charges, I just calculate what the voltage at this point from each one is and add them up. No directions involved. Very simple. So voltage is easier to work with. Equipotential lines are lines of constant voltage. Constant voltage means no change in energy per charge. So they have to be perpendicular to the electric field lines because if the charge moves parallel to an electric field line, it's going to gain or lose energy depending on the charge's sign. So equipotential lines where you can have motion of a charge and no change in potential energy have to be perpendicular to electric field lines. The, um, yeah, the, Positive charge always goes to lower electric potential because that's lower potential energy. Negative charge always goes to higher electric potential because that's lower potential energy. Then the capacitor rules. Capacitor, you got a question? Sorry, this is going back to electric field. Yes. What is the difference between voltage and capacitor? Okay, there is a technical difference, but there's not a practical difference. The technical difference is capital Q should be fixed and lowercase q can move around. That's the technical difference. But in practice, nobody follows the rule. So they're kind of used interchangeably yes. in Yeah. I Yeah, even textbooks will shift around if they're going to follow the rule or not. And I certainly don't pay enough attention to it myself. Okay, so for a capacitor, Capacitors are storing energy, and the capacitor has a fixed relationship. Capacitance is defined as C is equal to Q over V. I always memorize as Q equals VC because there's some store QVC. Or as a company, I don't know. <laughs> but the capacitance is defined as the charge divided by voltage. That charge, remember on a capacitor, everything we did was just simple two plates. You're going to have plus Q on one plate and minus Q on the other. So that Q is not the difference between the two plates or, you know, a specific plate. It's the charge on one plate or the charge on the other plate because <coughs> they should be equal. And V is the voltage difference. So V is actually, if you want to be technical, delta V the voltage difference across the capacitor. So you can always, if you know two, you can get the third of those. Since capacitors are physical constructs, we can construct and calculate the capacitance value by taking physical parameters. You take that kappa, which tells you about how good the insulator is between the plates, times epsilon zero, the permittivity of free space, times the area of each of the plates. Remember, our work is only for two parallel plates of equal size. 
divided by the separation. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, how do you know exactly when to use which of the two equations? Because they both well, have the. Okay, so this one here is simple. This one here is simple. This here is for physical construction of a capacitor. So if you're talking about the physical dimensions of the capacitor, this one here is the one you're dealing with. This one here is for how charge and voltage relate on the capacitor. So they're, they're in fundamentally different situations. Now, not always do we have simple things like that. This one here had a good simple delineation. Then the energy stored in a capacitor, because its goal is to store energy, is one half CV squared. So capacitors store energy. Given that C is Q over voltage, I can also write this as one half for C. I'm going to put Q over V times V squared. And that gives me one half QV. That's also correct. So you can, and you can write it also eliminating the V and having just C and Q. Because if you know two, you know the third. So just different ways of writing it. That's the energy stored in a capacitor. Now, something we didn't talk about that becomes important is the energy density. When we talk about electromagnetic waves, we're going to have electric fields and magnetic fields. And we're going to want to talk about the density of energy in the wave. And we can get that actually from this equation. Since the energy stored is one half CV squared, we can take for the capacitor, the voltage relates to the electric field. And then we can find the energy density by just, well, for capacitor, This is only true if you have a uniform constant electric field. The voltage difference is ED. And so if I put that in here, I would have the, um, put it into this form here. So there is the capacitance is the first, Thing in parentheses and then the voltage in red multiply that through area times separation is the volume for the capacitor so u divided by volume which we write as a lowercase u is equal to one half it's a kappa, epsilon zero times electric field squared. That's going to be an important result when we get to electromagnetic waves. The energy density stored in the electric field. So that's not something we talked about, but it's something I want to get in, get in there before we forget. That you can use the energy stored in a capacitor to find the energy stored in an electric field. Chapter 20. Chapter 20 is when we started circuits. 20 and 21 are both circuits. So in chapter 20, first thing we did was define current. Current is the rate at which charge flows by. So I put here delta Q over delta T. You're at one place in a circuit. You measure how much charge passes per second. That's the current. So it's units, of course, of coulombs per second. And then we have Ohm's law. Ohm's law, Georg Ohm noted the relationship. We draw a resistor like, okay, that color didn't work. I remember. Like this. And if the current goes this direction, then we can define the voltage difference as having the positive at the tail end of the arrow, the negative at the head end of the arrow. So the voltage difference, delta V, is the difference between those two locations with the positive as indicated. And Ohm's law says that that voltage difference, technically this voltage should be delta V. No, nope, you usually don't see it there. But it's the voltage difference between the two sides of the resistor is equal to the current going through the resistor times the value of the resistance. And if you want, the, the units for resistance are ohms. But you can take this equation and say, well, since R is equal to V over I, then that's joules per coulomb divided by coulombs per second. 
is equal to joule seconds per coulomb square. And that's the unit for an ohm. You never, ever see that written out, right? We just always write ohms for resistance. But that would be the technical um, definition for the ohm. And, of course, if you want to be even more technical, kilogram meters squared per second coulomb squared is putting it in the base units. So we have current, voltage we'd already learned, Ohm's law relates the two. The power that is dissipated in capacitor. Capacitors will take electrical energy and dissipate, usually, or capacitor, I said capacitors, I meant resistors. They dissipate that energy, they release it as heat. So if you put your finger on capacitors in a circuit, some of them will feel hot because they're dissipating the heat pretty quickly. And so the power is always current times voltage. And if the current and voltage are going the way I have shown there with the positive side is the butt end of the arrow, the negative side is the, um, is the pointy end of the arrow, then you're going to dissipate energy. It's energy going out. If it's reversed, which is the way it should be for power supply, then it's supplying energy rather than dissipating. So power supplies should have... Remember, the long size positive, short size negative, and they should have the current going like this. So the current in a power supply is going from negative to positive because it's supplying energy. And that power, the rate at which it's supplying energy is IV. Where is that? Right here. If it's a resistor, you can use Ohm's law to write it in terms of V and R or I and R. But this here is the always correct form. Because if you, if you memorize like V squared R or I squared over R, of course, I give you all the equations on the test. You should know that, Chad. Um, everyone else already knows that. If you memorize I squared over R and then you try to use that for a power supply, you're like, but there's no resistance. And you can't do it. You have to remember IV is the only one that's going to work for a power supply because that's the fundamental rule. Electric hazards and safety. You should know these things. You should know that a current under one milliamp, typically you cannot feel. A current of 10 milliamps or bigger, then you have involuntary muscle contractions commence. And here I put, I think, 75 and milliamps across the heart. We'll throw your heart into fibrillations, very deadly. If I, let's say my body had, well, let's just do this. Let's do an experiment. We got, I have material, I actually want a lecture on a few minutes, but. We'll do it anyway. What do you suppose the resistance is from one hand to the other hand? What do you think? Take a guess. From one hand? Yeah, so I'm going to grab one side with one hand and one side with the other. Probably similar to water. Similar to what? Similar to water. Similar to water. Well, water has a lot of variation there. If it's pure water, it's super high. If it's not, then it's much lower. Okay, no one's willing to put a number out there? Three. Three ohms. <laughs> put my fingers on here. Okay. It is, it's changing because, you know, my body does kind of hold the charge. It's showing around one mega ohm right now, but it's dropping. It was down to around... Um, 0.8 mega ohms. So it's a pretty high resistance. So if I want to get, you know, let, let's just say, I, I think like 200 would actually have been a good number. I left my stylus there. Let's say that my body has a resistance. Here, grab those and keep holding them. Let's say my body has a resistance of 200 kilo ohms. If I want to feel a shock, how much voltage do I have to have? Let's start with where's the current need to be? I is one milliamp. So V equals IR is equal to 200 kilo ohms times one milliamp 
equals 200 volts. So if my body's resistance was 200 kilo ohms, I, would, I wouldn't even feel a shock if I touched the 120 out here. My body's less than that because I do feel a shock when I touch this, right? Okay, now they're just playing. Um, so that 200 is a little high. What can we do to make it so we get shocked more easily? We have to lower the resistance, right? Well, here's one way of lowering resistance. Wet my skin. The skin is the primary resistive element of the body. Once this, it gets into the body, it's very low resistance. So if I wet my fingers on both hands, it's a much lower resistance than if I have them dry. Hence the dangers of you know, using the toaster in the bathtub. Um, <clears throat> yeah, because we all are thinking, why can't I make toast when I'm in the bathtub? Yeah. <laughs> Let's say you're watching Rambo. I think in Rambo they're torturing him using a car battery. Yes, battery. A car battery. A car battery that has a voltage of 12 volts. How much current are you going to have across, you know, let, let's say that you're instead of a instead of 200 kilo ohms, let's say that my, my skin's resistance is 50 kilo ohms. So let's say 50. If it's 50, then that would have been 50 volts is necessary to feel it, right? Well, if it's 12 volts and I want to have muscular contractions, involuntary muscular contractions, what does the current need to be? Greater than or equal to 10 milliamps then what is my resistance going to have to be? One point two. Well, twelve divided by that. Yeah, twelve divided by ten is one point two, and since it's ten milliamps, it's going to make it kilo ohms. So I need to get that resistance down to one point two kilo ohms. Your skin is not going to have resistance to one point two kilo ohms. It's going to be bigger than that. You can safely touch that car battery. You're not even going to feel anything because your resistance is too high. So how do they torture somebody with this? Okay, you wet them, but they did more. And they actually did this. If you flay the skin, if you cut the skin, then you got rid of the big resistor part. And then you cover them with water. So you touch here, it goes through the water, into the body, through the body. That's how you can torture somebody with the car battery. Okay, we don't torture people. I'm saying this, you know, for funny things. It's bad. I, I've never tried. I'm never going to try just to see how it works, you know. Not. <laughs> okay, somehow I heard him say sponge, and that took me to the electric chair where they, they put a wet sponge, I think, on top of your head and put a nice helmet and and then you get electricity going in that and, you know, the wet sponge is helping to conduct it into your body. Yeah, no, not good times. And that comes from watching TV, by the way. I don't know. Well, I've never... How do they do the injections? Hmm? Well, so, well, how they do the injections? Because they figured it was another thing to do with shots. I think Sparky's... I don't know. Yeah. It's... Death penalty is a whole different thing. I think Nebraska like approved the death penalty last year, which kind of makes me sad. I don't like it. I don't like killing. But that's not physics. That's not helping you for the test. Chapter 21, the last test, chapter to review for the test. Chapter 21 is all about solving circuit problems. And if you look on the tutorials, not only do you have the worksheets there, there's a tutorial on how to use your calculator to do RREF. And there's a separate tutorial on doing analysis. So you have another example besides what's in the worksheets. So you have your power supply. You do need to know what EMF means. EMF, you don't need to know it's electromotive force. You need to know that that means the voltage of a battery. And a real battery, because once you start using it, you're going to have the chemical reaction kicks in when the voltage drops. The voltage always drops when you use a battery. 
And if the battery is in poor shape, it drops more. And so we model a battery as having an internal resistance. So we model a battery. Here's the terminals of a, a cell, a single cell. This pointy one is the positive one. This is the negative. Inside you have an ideal cell in series with a little internal resistance. And so we mark that script E for the EMF, the ideal voltage supply in the cell, and then that R internal for the internal resistance. So when you put it in a circuit, the voltage across the terminals is going to drop when you use it because of that internal resistance. Okay, then we have Kirchhoff's laws, Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law. Kirchhoff's voltage law says that energy can't be created or destroyed. So you start here in the circuit, you come around to the same place, you better be at the same energy level. Kirchhoff's current law says that charge can't be created or destroyed. So charge coming into a location has to equal the charge leaving. Now, it can't be created, destroyed, or stored in a circuit. That's another part of Kirchhoff's current law. So we have those two laws. We have to be able to apply them. So you apply them in lab, you apply them for the homework assignment that was due last Wednesday. Um, if you do the worksheet, you'll have more application there. Make sure you can do that because you will definitely have a problem where you need to come up with at least one, if not multiple equations using Kirchhoff's current law and voltage law per circuit. You also need to know that the number of, well, how to identify an essential node and I was really embarrassed in my solution yesterday. I first identified all the nodes and I skipped one. And then when I was all done, I was like, wait, I got a different number of nodes. So I skipped one. Um, essential nodes I didn't mess up because those are the ones we actually use. But be able to identify what a node is, what an essential node is, what a mesh is, and we'll move this. Question, Lydia. Um, as far as like, the test goes, will we have a question as big as the one that you gave us on our worksheet? No. Okay. <laughs> will you have as much time then as you have for prepare? Same reason, right? Yeah, Leslie. So what is, um, I don't fully understand the difference between a mesh and the loop. Okay, a mesh is the smallest loops you can make. So if I have a circuit, okay. If I have a circuit that goes like this, that's similar to the one on our, you know, it's got resistors, power supplies, whatever. Loops could be like, here's a loop, right? going all the way around the circuit, coming back to where I started. That's a loop. But meshes are, uh, there is like an edit mode that I like. I like the edit mode. <laughs> um, pin, pin color, yellow pin. Meshes are the smallest loops you can make. So there's a mesh, there's a mesh, there's a mesh, there's a mesh, there's a mesh. So this circuit has five meshes. The way that I tell people to help you never make a mistake is think about a window. How many panes of glass do you have to have for the window? That's the number of meshes. So if I look at those windows back there, if that was an electric circuit, I would have three meshes, the top one, the middle one, the bottom one. As far as loops, I could have each of those three meshes or I could have the top two is a loop, the bottom two is a loop, and the entire thing is a loop. So there's more loops than there are meshes. And you have to make a number of, well, you can make, you, for a solving circuit you will make, a number of loop equations equal to the number of meshes, and you have to cover every element in the circuit. When I was doing my example, I, I, was tired. I wrote I4R4 where I met I6R6 two times. Well, in the end, when I looked at my equations, I had R6 not used anywhere, and I knew I had a mistake. That's how I knew I had a mistake, because I didn't use R6. And thankfully, I was consistent in making that mistake, so I was able to identify quickly what the problem was. So you have to cover all of the circuit. If you use the meshes for your loops, you will have the right number of loops, and you'll cover the entire circuit. Michael. Well, it's, it's the same equation for a loop as for a mesh. It's just, I, I always recommend just do it on the meshes because that way you know you've chosen an appropriate set. 
Okay, voltmeters and ammeters. Um, I didn't actually lecture about that, so that I'm not going to put any questions on on the test. Finally, transient circuits. Transient circuits are circuits that are changing from one state to another. For a transient circuit, no matter what kind of circuit, you always have the voltage in the transient circuit is equal to the voltage you have initially minus the voltage you have finally, either minus time over something called tau plus voltage final and current is equal to current initial minus current final e to the minus t over that same tau. <laughs> That's a plus sign. Those are always true for a transient circuit. And so what you need to do is find the voltage initial and the voltage final and what tau is. So we went through and we did an example of that for a circuit that has resistor and capacitor. And for resistor and capacitor, which is all we have for this test, tau is equal to resistance times capacitance. And there's an example in the worksheet of how to do that. So I recommend just going through doing that example. If you can't do it, look at my solution. It'll show you how to do it. That's my review for the test. I have 10 minutes left to talk about my lecture for the day, which is why we had a reading quiz. Any questions before I go into my lecture? Wes first. Yes. So I know when we uh, do circuits, sometimes there's less or more currents than like, I expect. Like say you've got three resistors and a battery, but there's only two currents that it says mm -hmm. on the thing. How do we know like which current is going through which? Okay, it's a good question. It's a good question. You have a circuit like Okay, let's say we just have a circuit like this. In this circuit, we oftentimes want to write this current and this current as two separate currents. But in fact, because they are one branch, that is one pathway to go from an essential node to another essential node, anything on that branch has to have the same current. So those would be the same currents, not separate currents. And the directions have to match, of course. And then here I would have a second current. And here I would have, I don't want to use that color, a third current. Each branch has its current. And it's the same current in the entire branch. And then you, when you get to essential nodes, that's where the currents combine or separate. And so this would have, because it has three branches, it would have three currents. And those in the left-hand side, I have two resistors that the current goes through. In the middle one, I only have one resistor the current goes through. And in the final one, there's no resistors it goes through. We only use the current in a loop equation if we're using Ohm's law. The, the um, I said the loop equation, right? Kirchhoff's voltage law, we're adding the voltage rises and voltage drops. And so if you have a resistor, you use Ohm's law and the current appears. If you don't have a resistor, then the current doesn't appear in your Kirchhoff's voltage law equation. So if I make a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation for this mesh, I'm not going to have current three in that equation because there's no resistor that current three goes through. But I will have current three in my node equation for whichever the two nodes I use. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so like in that picture, I2 would only exist between the nodes. I2 would only go between my, my cyan node and my red node um, on that path. Okay, I had three questions over here. Leslie, then Mira, then... Um, DJ. So how exactly are you going to grade these current ones? Because I mean, the, I'm guessing we're not going to have to be the ones that draw the circuit. So um, do you still want us to do everything else pretty much? Or? Well, what you will do is you will annotate the circuit. 
appropriately, drawing the current arrows, labeling them, and so on, and identifying your nodes, identifying your branches, so on. Mira. You, you changed the I2 to an I1. Oh, that was your... I, well, I, I'd written that at first, and then when I did the whole, you know, they got to be the same, I didn't change it. DJ. Um, so I know in homework, we often look up the mass of a proton, mass of an electron. <laughs> Is that going to be given? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. <laughs> no. Yeah. I don't make you memorize much of anything. Chad. You're doing Ohm's law. You're using kilo ohms instead of just ohms. Yeah. Is that... I, I'm sorry. I, it's something you end up doing a lot. It, we use, of course, volts, amps, and ohms. Or you can use um, volts, kilo ohms, and milliamps. Because kilo times milli is one. And so in my brain, it goes just as easily that way. And I realized when I was doing it, this might confuse them, but I was like, well, it's right. So. Um, so in the homework, you said that you were going to do the homework with the homework in the worksheet from last night. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to remember which one it was. It was either 19 or 20. It might have been 19. Uh, it, it was, I thought it was 20. I, well, no, it was It was 19. You're right. Um, is that something that we need to, I saw one of those kind of questions on yes. practice test too. Is that something that we need to kind of know? Yes, yes. You should be able to, because, you know, we talked about the um, change of potential energy for the charge. And so we should be able to translate from change of potential energy into, it's, Electric force is conservative. So if the potential energy goes down, then the kinetic energy goes up. And then we're going back to last, last semester's knowledge about kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Also, make sure that you do know the electron volt is a unit because, well, it's easier. Electron volt is the charge of an electron multiplied by a volt. Really, truly now, the material for today. Yeah, we're not going to cover very much. Um, you can have an electric force on a charge, what this test is going to be about. And if we have an electric field, it's easy. That force is charge times electric field. But you can also have a magnetic force on the same charge. And so if we have a charge that's moving, remember the magnetic force requires the charge to be moving. We have a charge that's moving in a region with electric field and a magnetic field, then we're going to have forces from both. And so a special situation that we like to do is to have a charge moving through a region with electric field and magnetic field so that the net force is zero. So here's the situation. Some of the force is equal to force electric plus force magnetic, and that's zero. And the first question to ask yourself is, what direction does the electric field and the magnetic field have to be for this to be true? So let's start with the directions. Let's say that I have a particle with a velocity in the z direction is shown here, and the electric field is shown as well. If it's a positive charge, well, I'm going to do it if it's positive first, and then we'll reverse it in two minutes. If Q is positive, what direction is the electric force on that charge? Oh, it shows. <laughs> well, ignoring those blue lines. So if Q is positive, then the electric force is going to be in this direction. So if the net force is zero, then I'm going to have to have the magnetic forces opposite to that. And then we can use the right-hand rule to find the direction the magnetic field is going to have to be. So remember the right-hand rule. What's the equation? It's written up there, right? Yeah. The force for magnetic is QV cross V. So if I use the right-hand rule, which finger corresponds with which element? Okay. The thumb. There's no current that equation. Okay. <laughs> But Leslie said, in one of them it is. it is. Leslie said that the velocity is the index finger. She's correct. 
What are the other fingers? Okay, the middle finger is going to be the magnetic field. And then what's the thumb point? The force. So what I gave you, as I said, we have the velocity that's known, and we have the force direction. So I take my right hand, put my index finger coming out, my thumb going the direction of the force, and my middle finger points the direction that the magnetic field has to be to make it so I can have a net force of zero. And because of time, I have to stop there with just how we use the right-hand rule to determine what the direction of the magnetic field is going to have to be with respect to the velocity and electric field. And do note those are all mutually perpendicular. Yes, ma'am. Oh, we have to penalize for the reading quiz because I, I checked last night and I don't know why I didn't see 